Hi students, welcome to the Baiju's Hindu News Analysis for 9th of August 2018. So let's get started. So let's look into the first article. So the first article says alarm over deadly pest in Karnataka. So what exactly is the context? So when we look into the context, it says that the Indian Council for Agricultural Research has sounded the alarm after the invasive agricultural pest, namely called as fall army worm, has actually been discovered in Karnataka this July. So the first point that we need to understand from the prelims perspective is what exactly is the Indian Council for Agricultural Research. So this is basically a factual information. This can be a potential question from the prelims perspective. So let's discuss the facts first. So the most important point is it is an autonomous organization which is coming under the Department of Agricultural Research and Education which is in the Ministry of Agricultural and Farmers Welfare. So the ICAR is actually headquartered in New Delhi. The council is the apex body for coordinating, guiding, managing research and education in agriculture including horticulture, fisheries and animal sciences in the entire country with 101 ICR institutes and 71 agricultural institutes spread across the country. This is one of the largest agricultural systems in the world. It has played a major role in promoting excellence in the higher education in agriculture. It is engaged in cutting edge areas of science and technology development and its scientists are internationally acknowledged in the field. So kindly remember all these facts. This can also be asked in the prelims examination. So that is why we are making sure that you know this. So now coming back to this particular pest, what we would be discussing in detail is the fall army worm. Let's try and understand what exactly it says. So this pest is actually was discovered in 2016 in Africa. So even before its discovery, what exactly happened was this is one of those pests which majorly attacks the maize crop and this was already happening in North America. But in 2016, it was discovered in Africa. So the minute it was discovered, what it did is it colonized entire continent. So number of countries, around 44 countries, was actually colonized by this particular pest and it led to a lot of economic losses. And the most important thing is it not only attacks the maize, what is the most important point is it also attacks the other species. Let's say for example amongst the plant it also includes the rice, the millet, sugarcane and cotton. So what it further goes on to say is because India has tropical climate, it could also allow the pest to thrive. So our most important point is with respect to India. So what exactly is the concern? So because India has a tropical climate, what will happen is this will give a breeding ground for all this pest to survive in this particular climate and weather conditions. So what we need to understand is because it is discovered in Karnataka, it may spread to the entire country and it will also spread to the subcontinent which includes all the neighboring countries of Bangladesh, Pakistan or Afghanistan as well. So the main concern right now is now that it has appeared in Karnataka, the other states like Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu are in the pipeline. So it can be a grave threat to all the farmers who are actually growing maize. So initially it can start off with maize but it can actually go on increasing to all other crops and that's the major concern and because farmers are going to suffer we will have to know what exactly this fall army worm is all about so what we also need to understand is the fact that how is that we're going to control this particular fall army so the most important point is there are two ways that we are constructing it or demolishing this particular fall army one is the natural process the other one is by inducing certain insecticides so the first line of defense against the fall army will be the insecticides that is lamb Lambda Silorathrin. So kindly remember this word. It is the Lambda Silorathrin, which is actually an insecticide, which can be the first step that a particular farmer has to do in order to make sure he demolishes this particular insecticide or a particular pest by using this insecticide. And at the same time, there is also a natural way, and that is by using certain biological indicators. So what do we have to do? Is we'll have to use certain natural predators such as the saucinellid beetles that can actually aid as a biological control. However, the problem right now is these biological indicators that are used which are naturally occurring predators can actually not be of much of an impact. But what is the most important thing is the insecticides that we would be using are more mechanical and more efficient rather than the naturally occurring ones. So these are the measures that we would be able to take in order to fight this particular mechanism. 
mechanism and more research and development will be taken in the future and the government will come up with a mechanism to make sure that this particular pest which can actually cause a lot of economic losses to the farmer are actually ebbed in its particular journey so this is all we will have to understand from this article so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article says supreme court constitutes panel to look into issues plaguing jails in country so what exactly is the context so the supreme court was actually looking into one of the pils to actually validate the number of conditions that the jailmates are currently undergoing and it has also asked the government to actually provide number of better facilities that, than what is being given to the jail inmates. So what exactly is the whole idea of this article is that there are number of people who are actually suffering in the jail, the number of people in a particular prison are more and there are number of under trials who are not provided the basic amenities and because they are not provided certain basic amenities within the jail campus what the government has actually said this that we are looking into it but the Supreme Court has said that you need to provide them more opportunities and more facilities which you are not currently doing so what ex to this particular criticism there is a conversation that happens between the government as well as the Supreme Court so the government has currently said that when you are you the Supreme Court when you are actually saying that we need to provide certain amenities and also facilities you should also cater to the mind that we are almost investing in number of sectors we will have uh, we as a government will have to incorporate the money into the health sector the education sector and the infrastructure so we are already investing in a number of sectors and because we are already investing in a number of sectors we are already tied up it's not that we are saying that we won't be doing it but it will take time for us to actually implement all these domains changes with respect to the jail campus so you will have to wait and watch and at the same time what it has also said is there are other key sectors which are also facing issues and because we will have to address this this may take some more time and it may get delayed so you will have to wait and watch just don't uh, on a unilateral basis tell that we are not doing anything but instead we are doing but it will take some more time is the government view but what exactly has the supreme court said the supreme court has said yes we are not criticizing you on this particular move but instead what you need to focus is on the number of things that are are actually missing let's say for example the women prison the number of rights of the children all these things are not being provided and there is also overcrowding of the prisons and the those people who are actually staying within the prisons are actually not getting the basic amenities like the health and the education and the basic food facilities that needs to be decided so you are supposed to come up with the renovation and infrastructural development which you are not currently doing and all the funds that have been provided have been used for something else so what we are saying is provide them these amenities and when you are providing these amenities we will not be interfering is the supreme court said and it has further said that we are here to actually protect the fundamental right of a particular person if you're not providing all these amenities just because he is in the jail so it means that there is a grave violation of fundamental rights under article 21 so any person for that matter whether he is in jail whether he is outside he has to be given the dignified life and if there is no dignified life that is being given to him it means that you are violating article 21 and that is a fundamental right and whenever there is a fundamental right violation the court will step in and that is why we have stepped up it's not that we we are criticizing but because there are certain lacuna areas that needs to be looked into that is why we are just asking you to look into once again and what the supreme court has further said is that there will be a committee that will be appointed under the chairmanship of the retired judge to look into the jail matters with look into the overcrowding and this will come about suggesting measures so you can also come up with other three members who can be a part of this particular panel so once these people resource all these things come about constructing a particular platform as to what is the major problems then we will incorporate all the changes is what this article all about so we should know a, a basic idea about the number of reforms that the jail committee will be looking into which we will be discussing in the future classes so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article is speaking about the lateral entry so when you look into the context we did know that the central government has actually come up with one of the applications for the lateral entry of all the bureaucracy so it wants to fill in at least 10 posts for the joint secretary so it has asked the number of people from different domains to actually file an application for the same so that all those people who are interested in working in the government sector would be able to file their particular application and on the basis of their expertise the people will be called in for the interview and they'll be asked to work in the relevant government domain so this is the context so what is the, how exactly is the current secretariat functions so when we understand how exactly 
and the secretariat currently functions what we have first is the technical team or those teams which is actually planning a particular execution so you have something like the planning and then you have the implementation then you have the policy formulation and then the implementation so what initially happens is so we have a number of steps or the number of hierarchy as to how things actually happen with respect to the final implementation from the grassroots level from the line officers to the political mastery how exactly is the thing that is functioning is what we will have to understand initially so the first point that we will have to understand is let's say for example there are number of specialized departments let's say for example with respect to the central public works department so the central public works department or the central water commission or the number of other public sector undertakings all these people have certain technical associations and these people are known for their technical profess and all these people initially plan up a particular framework so this framework is actually provided by a specialist team so first we have is a specialized team so this can be a technical team and this will provide a particular draft and this draft then goes to a joint secretary so joint secretary is a person who is actually a bridge between the implementation and then with the formulation so what exactly happens is first it is the specialized agency let's say for example in this case the central public works department or the central water commission they actually prepare a particular draft and once the draft is submitted it goes to the joint secretary so the joint secretary is like the bridge he acts like the bridge to understand what exactly is happening at the specialized agency and he also would know what exactly is happening at the formulation agency so he takes up all the draft from the specialized agency and then this joint secretary actually pushes it across to the secretary or the different implementing or the formulating agency so what exactly happens in this particular point is now that the joint secretary has actually taken this particular move it goes up to the secretary and this secretary actually starts interacting with the number of departments so what exactly happens is let's say for example with respect to one of the health issues so we have a particular person let's say for example a doctor so doctor has a particular view only with respect to his zone of expertise so he would know everything with respect to the health parameters so he would do everything with respect to the health issues so you would say let's say for example there is HIV so these are the medicines that would be required so I want these medicines and he'll implement a particular framework but when it is actually coming up to the actual formulation so what the secretary and the joint secretary do is it will require some finance it will also require the social indicators so or there are different other parameters so there are number of ground agencies which are also looking into the health there are number of NGOs and there are number of civil society organizations which are working so what the secretary will actually do is he will connect to a number of departments so apart from the health department or number whatever the specialized agency is looking into he'll have to connect to the other departments let's say for example apart from the health department he has to speak to the finance department he has to speak to the NGOs that are actually so located he has to speak to the social society so all these people will have to be looked into and then after garnering all the information that is supposed to be given by these institutes then what he'll do is he would lay it before the minister so he would consider all these people for example the different departments the different associations that are actually involved with its implementation and all these people are actually considered he would make an analysis of what exactly is happening with the other relevant departments and once of getting a broader idea then this particular secretariat will actually function and then a relevant information would be provided to the political executive so the political executive in this matter is the minister so what the secretary at the final level will do is he would be able to communicate at the final moment what are the various whereabouts of this particular implementation and he'll tell the same thing to the political master the minister so it is the political master that is the minister who will be the final executive agency or he'll the person who is going to give a nod to this particular ministry so this is a long process right and for this particular process there needs to be a coordination and for this coordination you need to know how exactly things work out at different levels different departments and and you need that expertise and the crucial understanding and negotiation with all these departments the specialist will not have all these idea the specialist will only know the something with respect to their zone or their 
mental framework but they won't have ideas with respect to the other domains or with respect to the other domain departments it is these generalists that is the secretariat which will actually work in order to bring all these departments under one particular umbrella and make sure that this particular thing is acting as a whole and then the information is actually put up in the public forum but what exactly happens is is the lateral entry people capable of answering all this is some of the questions that needs to be answered so one of the points as to will lateral entry be able all these people who do not have much of an idea with respect to how the secretariat works how exactly the inter department works all these things will the lateral entry people will be able to coordinate will they be able to work on this is one of the parameters that we need to understand and at the same time what we also need to understand is that there is a problem with respect to this area that is the current system of IAS who are actually there or the system that is currently there with respect to the civil service is it able to understand the different problems and the dimensions let's say for example there is a threat to internal security from the cyber warfare are these people capable of understanding what exactly is the cyber warfare what are the various areas of this particular area not exactly let's say for example the economics is changing every single day are these people are equipped to actually understand the complex complex economic issues in case they are good fair and fine but majority of the people are actually generalists and because they are generalists they are again not capable of answering these queries at the same time what also needs to be understood is a fact that these people they are not able to understand the different technological dimensions so because they are not able to understand the technological dimensions will they be able to advise the minister is the next thing and at the same time let's look into the urbanization sector so there are number of things that are happening with respect to the urbanization the flooding the flash floods and different types of things so how will these people with the increasing level of complexity provide decision making which is actually a domain of specialist is some of the question and at the same time there are different ministries that these people actually travel to let's say for example they travel to the civilization ministry they travel to the tourism ministry they travel to the defense ministry they are not in a particular department and because they are not in a particular department because they have moved to every other department they do not have a complete control of one department and because they are handling different portfolios how is that they would be able to understand what exactly is the core of that particular area so all these things is currently not there in the present civil service and these IAS people are ill equipped that is why we need the lateral entry is another point so but if the next point that we need to understand this is lateral entry something new not exactly lateral entry has always been in existence only thing is the government has opened it once again with respect to the number of people who are coming in the private sector so what do we mean by lateral entry or the specialization in this particular domain people have always been giving suggestions let's say for example the number of engineers the doctors the agricultural scientists lawyers they have been a part of the decision making process in the earlier implementation model as well and there are the secretaries to the departments of the atomic energy and then the science and technology the scientific and the industrial research or the health research the agricultural research are having people of eminence who have been contributing through this particular lateral entry and there have been number of departments like the railways the post all these senior positions currently that are there are actually manned by these people who are actually the specialists so why actually come up with this particular idea of lateral entry newly is one of the questions that pops up so what exactly is the problem with this lateral entry yes the, the lateral entry actually drives in number of things it brings in expertise it brings in a lot of knowledge with it it will bring in a number of institutions changes but there is also another thing that there is a scary thing that is happening within the domain of IAS so what exactly is this let's say for example these people who would be employed or who these people will be recruited will be recruited by the political masters so what would happen is these political masters would actually prefer those people who would actually say yes to their type of ideologies so what would happen in this particular case is the political readership can actually create a divide and rule mechanism so they may actually lift all those people who have come through the lateral entry who are ready to actually say yes to whatever they are saying but these IAS people may not do because they are constitutionally bound and these people are only bound to the constitution so what it currently says is there is a bit of 
issue and that issue is in case lateral entries are actually recruited by the political masters then these people are actually say okay to all the political nominations that they are doing but instead the IAS people are bound by the constitution these people will not do it that way because they are held accountable but that's not the same with the lateral entry and at the same time what exactly happens is there are certain people who would be recruited because of their political ideologies few people would have a political ideology and these people would be recruited on their based on the political ideologies but what we will have to serve is a non-partitionship there should be no partition that is happening with respect to these things impartiality has to be there which is actually one of the most important metal of the IAS and the civil service but these people in case they are recruited on the basis of ideology will they be serving the people is the next question that comes up and what can also happen is this can also lead to the privatization of the IAS what would happen is the government for that matter will have have certain people who would be funding their parties and this will be the private sector and these private sectors can actually do a lobbying and make sure that they are placing their men into the government sector so all the changes that are being bought up within the government sector can be actually helping that particular party and that particular company which is actually funding that political party so it can again privatize the whole IAS and there are also fears that have been said that there will be revolving door theory so now that this particular person has actually work the, the government sector he would know how exactly the government works so he may get back to the private sector and once he works into the private sector he may put all the important security details or the defense details and other details that he knows within the government sector and he may put it to the private sector this can also be a threat to the government as what is being said in this article so what is the way forward so what are the reforms that needs to be taken care so what we need to currently do is that there are IAS officers who are currently working at the ground level so these people are a form of, form part of the grassroots level so they are into this district administration initially so what will happen is they are involved into a number of things with respect to the district administration so what should happen is after let's say for about 8 to 10 years after their expertise are done with respect to the district administration these IAS based on their aptitude based on their qualification and then based on their preference what they should do is they should specialize in that particular area let's say for example he's already done his MBA so he is good with respect to finance so he should be dealing in detail about finance let's say for example there is a particular person who is more involved with respect to tourism so he wants to bring about a change with respect to the tourism sector so let him pick up a specialization with respect to tourism there is another person who is actually done as public administration MA in public administration or public policy so he knows how what are the ill effects of urbanization so he would be able to stop how exactly the floods are happening in the urban city so make sure after the initial 10 years of specialization in the district administration is done they would pick up such social sectors and they become an expert in that particular field this is also what is followed in the Japan's bureaucracy so Japan has a very similar system why not we acknowledge the same thing is one of the parameters what this article speaks about and the other important parameter that it says is just like how we are actually letting come the private people into the government the IAS should also go to the private sector they should gain some experience and they should go to the private sector understand how exactly the efficiency work how competitive they are what are the steps that they take so when the minute they get into the private sector they will understand how exactly it is being worked about and the minute they understand and how the private sector works in terms of the effectiveness and their efficiency they would learn those things and the same thing could be adapted to the government sector so these are some of the reforms that the article has actually gone about saying so what could be the conclusion bit so on the conclusion bit what can actually be happening is whatever the government done in this present status that is incorporating or the dis notifying this particular lateral entry is a good move why because what will now happen is all those people who were lethargic who are not contributing much to the growth of India will now start getting scared and now these civil servants who are not working now because there is competition this will help in weeding out of the inefficient IAS officers so because they are actually becoming competitive right now these people will start contributing so there are number of people who are actually 
bowing to the political masters and now what they are actually doing is because of the competition they'll be shaken and there'll be that competitive spirit that will be taken and all those complacent higher civil servants will eventually have to change their character will eventually have to change how they work about and these people will have to bring about a change so that these people are also incorporating all the functionalities that is required in terms of the efficiency in terms of the effectiveness for the government sector so this is what this article basically speaks about so moving on let's look into the next article so this article says strengthen PSB boats IMF tells government so what exactly is the context so when we look into the context it says that the International Monetary Fund has actually suggested that certain measures will have to be taken by the government in order to improve the state owned bank's operation and also its function so what exactly are the detailing that it speaks about it says that all the banks that are there currently within India have to be provided the autonomy and when we provide the autonomy what they'll be able to do is they'll be able to take an independent stand they'll be able to strategize the way in which the private sectors are working and they'll be able to bring in the efficiency and when they bring in the efficiency it will lead to increase in the profits and then it will obviously reduce the ineffectiveness of that particular banking so what we you as a government should do is you should be providing them the more autonomy and at the same time you will have to provide them the independence and when you provide them the quality of independence as well as the autonomy what this will foster us and increase in the number of banking system having their own set of banking board and this board will be able to work effectively and what will eventually happen is once you have actually made sure that this particular system is intact what you should be doing in the future is you should be privatizing this whole banking system so initially give them the autonomy make sure that this particular system of banking is actually rejuvenated and once this is done once it is stabilized once the non-performing assets are completely ready Used, what you can do is you can privatize them so once the privatization happens what it will do is they'll work in the form of efficiency as like the private sector are working and this will actually reform the whole banking system is what the IMF has actually said the government so these are just the advisories and the government has nowhere said that it will be actually implementing this particular program so what exactly is the IMF has further said so the IMF has further said that India is actually recovering from this particular process so in India is actually going through an economic growth and it will be recovering in a particular year of 2018 and 19 and this would further be strengthened in the year 2019 and 20 and this will be making sure that the government should actually has a orientation towards stability oriented macroeconomic policies and government also brings about certain structural reforms to actually make sure that the economy is actually in a stable mode at the same time what it has also said is currently India is actually getting a lot of FDIs so in order to make sure that the FDIs is actually improved in order to get more FDIs the government will have to change or make tweaks within its policy so in case it is actually making certain changes or with respect to amendments what the government should be doing is it has to make sure that all the barriers that are affecting the trade barriers and there are a number of things like the documentation requirements the lowering of the tariffs continuing to improve the business climate and the overall governance in terms of the corruption when it is reduced the ease of business will improve and when this improves what will happen is more FDIs will be actually driving is what this particular IMF actually says when what the IMF actually says is that there are certain concerns so what exactly is the down downside concerns on the risk associated one of the major problem is the increase in the global oil prices as well as the global financial conditions on one side the oil prices are actually increasing every day and then there are certain financial conditions let's say for example us has actually brought about a number of changes in terms of the protectionism and this protectionism against the global idea of globalization could be a threat to the economy so there is higher prices and then there is tighter global financial and and there are also domestic risks that are included that is involving the revenue shortfalls or delay in addressing the twin bank corporate balance sheets all this could be a problem of concerns at the same time what it has also said the government and the RBI is that the, there is a lot of inflation and because of the oil rise and then there is protectionism and the trade war that is happening this is obviously leading to the inflation so what the RBI should currently do is it should actually tighten its monetary policy and make sure 
that there is no further rise in the inflation so be based on these things will the government do it or not do it we will be discussing in future but as of now these are some of the things that the IMF has actually communicated the same thing to the government so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article is something to do with the awareness to help clean Ganga visit an ATM on page one watch up to roll out educational videos on page 10 and this is to do with lynching and other things to honor to make sure that the fake news are actually reduced CPEC won't create debt burden on page 12 park troops to get training at Russian Institute on page 12 and Chinese exports accelerate even as Trump escalates trade war with further tariff this we have already put up a video with respect to the Baiju's YouTube analysis so kindly look into all these things so please visit the Baiju's CNA look into the practice questions both prelims and mains write all your answers on the comment section we will evaluate and give you the relevant feedback for the same so this is it for today thank you so much all the best